we're good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Is the mic on? You guys can hear it? Okay. From up there? الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم اجعل ما تعلمناه حجة لنا لا علينا we praise Allah, God Almighty, the Lord of everything in existence. And we testify that He is the only one deserving of worship. He is alone without any partners and associates. And we testify that Muhammad is His servant and His messenger. We ask Him to bless this messenger, Muhammad, to honor and compliment him, to elevate his mention and rank, and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers, as He did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past. We ask Allah to teach us what benefits us and to allow us to benefit from the things that we learn. And to increase us in knowledge, we ask him to make the things that we learn an evidence for us and not an evidence against us. And welcome to another session of prophetic stories, illustrations of life, where we're covering the times of the messenger, his life and times, specific events. And we're trying to extract morals and lessons to carry out in our daily lives. So what I wanted to start off with is, I don't know if I mentioned this principle before, but many people, when they look at stories, stories that are mentioned in the Qur'an, they are expecting more detail. People typically like a lot of trivial information. And the Qur'anic narrative does not have many names. Beside the names of the messengers, not many other names are mentioned. It doesn't have places. Locations are not typically mentioned, except as an exception to the rule. Uh, dates, times, numbers. Now, if you're familiar with other religious texts, a lot of that stuff is included. And the point behind that is that the Qur'an is meant for guidance. So any detail that's trivial and doesn't really have any influence on or impact on how we are to behave is not included therein. So our scholars say, worry about the moral of the story and don't get stuck on the detail. Now, this is a very interesting principle because sometimes when we learn Islamic studies, our teachers, what they would do is they would give certain examples to simplify a particular topic. And most people don't actually look at the example, they get stuck in the detail. And that's not the point. The point is something beyond that. So the moral of the story rather than the details. At any rate, today's talk is about Aisha, Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, uh, the daughter of Abu Bakr and the wife of the Messenger So we said before that the mothers of the believers is a title given exclusively to the Messenger's wives. The Messenger has more rights upon the believers than they do over their own selves. And his wives are their mothers. Now they're not your biological mothers, but they are mothers as far as respect is concerned and as far as honor is concerned. And also there are specific rules and regulations related to them. Just like a mother, we are not allowed to marry them after the Prophet's passing. So that early community recognized that that was a restriction. So today, the story is that there was a lottery that took place. The lottery is who is going to travel with the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he had more than one wife. And what he would do is he would allow them to do a lottery whenever he went out on a journey, so he could be fair. And whoever gets her lot out is the one that's 
uh, going to travel with him. She was someone who was beloved to the messenger and she was, again, younger in age. She is beautiful and she loved to beautify herself. Uh, and she, at this particular event, was in her mid-teens. And what she had done was she borrowed a necklace from her sister Asma. So Asma is the older sister. Asma, again, is another very important figure in Islam. She's the wife of Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. She is the mother of Abdullah ibn Az-Zubayr. And uh, she's one of those early believers who supported the messenger from the very early days of his ministry. So she had borrowed this necklace to wear it specifically on this journey. And when they used to travel, traveling was not an easy ordeal. It was extremely difficult and it was very painful. Uh, the other day I went and took my children to a little playground. We just moved to a new area and they had a playground. So they had something that basically rocks back and forth. It looked like a seesaw, but it doesn't, you don't ride it like this way. Two people ride it and it goes back and forth. It's, it's shaped like a plane. So I told them, when you ride a camel, that's exactly how it feels. You go this way and that way and this way and that way and it keeps on rocking with you in that fashion. Um, and that particular journey, again, most of the journeys of the Messenger وسلم, that are recorded, they were actually battles. They were not like he didn't go out on vacation. So uh, he was going out to the front lines either to defend the community or to uh, investigate and uh, find out what's going on, what are the plots of the enemies. Because again, the Muslim community was constantly under attack. And they were a new uh, player on the scene and they had a lot of enemies. That particular battle was called Ghazwa to Dhat al This is a very interesting event. Dhat al Ruqa is basically like a little rag that you have. That's what a Ruqa is. So that al they said the heat was so hot when they would step on the sand. Now their shoes were not like our shoes. They didn't wear boots. That it was so hot that their nails would melt. Their toenails would melt. So it was so hot that they wrapped their feet with rags to protect their feet from the elements. They had sandals. That was the common uh, footwear. But it was so hot that they had to cover them with extra layers to protect them from the elements. So the messenger of God came back from the expedition. So basically, uh, when we say a battle, this does not actually mean like a full-on war. And again, I always remind people that when we listen to these things and we review them, our mind should not project our norms of how people fight right now. Modern warfare, I think, is uh, unprecedented in human history. Humans have never been this violent, ever. They used to use swords, but they used to get tired after they kill a few people. Right now you throw a smart bomb from hundreds of miles away and you take out a whole village. And you don't even feel it, it's like a video game. So I want us not to project our common information about what a battle is. A battle typically here, they would go out and they're out in the desert. And then basically they're going to find out who's plotting against them. Sometimes there is a showdown, sometimes there is no showdown. In fact, most of the battles, that's how it was. They would go out and the other side simply doesn't show up. But that's considered a battle, although it didn't actually take place. So a more accurate depiction would be an expedition, but not a vacation. So now he's coming back from this particular event. And he stays, he camps out in an area called al Bayda. And al Bayda is basically a few plateaus that are seeing or overseeing Wadi al-Aqiq. Wadi al-Aqiq is a particular canyon that is on the western side of Medina. On the western side of Medina. And in this particular location, Aisha loses her necklace. Remember the story now. Don't, don't, get, don't get your mind going elsewhere. The story is about Aisha and her necklace. So when she lost her necklace, she freaks out. How can this happen? Again, this is something of value. And not just because it is valuable, but because it belongs to someone else as well. So this is like layers of value added on top of one another. So then she complains to the Messenger of God Check this out. This is right after a battle. 
right? Because a lot of us, this is how we think, you know. We think just because something doesn't concern us and it's insignificant for us, then it should be insignificant for others. What the messenger teaches us time and again is regardless of what your feelings are, if someone else has a concern, you should show empathy to their concern. So we're told one event, he goes to a family that he used to often visit and they had a little boy and that little boy had a little pet bird and the pet bird died and the messenger of God came over and he started inquiring because he saw the facial expressions on the young boy and he was extremely sad to lose his pet which is natural children when they lose their pets it's probably the first death in their lives They've, they don't typically experience death so he was distraught and he was hurt. So the messenger of God, we have it recorded. He asks him and he inquires. He says, Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'ala al And the scholars extract about 50 religious rulings out of that statement and that particular event. So he showed empathy. Of course, he could have said, What's the big deal? You lost a bird, let's get you another bird. Right? That's what people think. Oh, you lost your puppy? Let's get another puppy. What about the feelings that are hurt? Are you going to consider those feelings? Because it didn't hurt your feelings. Maybe it hurt your pocket, right? You got to buy another pet. Or you say, alhamdulillah, he died. <laughs> we don't have to worry about food. We don't have to worry about litter box, right? Maybe you plotted to kill the thing. I don't know. But the point is, the messenger of God shows us that if someone has a concern, I'm going to pay attention to their concern. So then the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually starts paying attention to this complaint. And he takes it very seriously and he starts, he, he, he realizes this had great value for her. This wasn't something insignificant. Now again, this is the same messenger that we know was not attracted to this material life, right? And wealth did not mean much to him. But this is not his personal wealth. So again, you cannot project your feelings onto others and say, get over it. It's a temporary life anyway. <laughs> you know, be patient. You lost it. What's the big deal? He didn't say any of that stuff. So let's see what he said. Now, now we know the price of this particular necklace. It cost 12 bucks. 12 dirhams. 12 silver coins. Okay? That's the price. So what he did was send a team of his companions to search for the necklace. And the head of this group is Usaid ibn Khudayr. This is like a big shot amongst the Sahaba. This is not like little, you know, he didn't send one of the kids in the community and say, you know, why don't you find her necklace? He sent an adult that is responsible, a leader in Medina, and he says, you lead this group and go and find this necklace. And then the messenger of God is waiting for them. So basically everything comes to a halt here and they stop and they're waiting for an update. And everyone else is waiting because if their leader is waiting, they also are going to leave. It was nighttime now. The evening approached, darkness came by, and the messenger of God spends the night out there. They don't come back to Medina yet. Medina is not too far away. But they decide we're going to camp out here. And they didn't have water with them. Because this was what? Again, when you go out camping, you typically take as much stuff as you need. So they knew they had an expedition and they're heading back to Medina. This was an unexpected event, an accident, if you will. So they didn't have water with them. And that's the most important thing when you're out in the desert. So then it's time for salah. And Muslims need water when they perform salah. They need to wash themselves, ritual washing, to perform their ritual. How are they going to do that? So now they're stressing out. And remember that these people actually really cared about salah. Like salah was a huge concern for them. So some of us, that's not a big deal. You know, we say, you know what? Okay, when I get back home, I'll make wudu and make up all five salahs that I missed today. All right? But these people were distraught. Time for salah came in. We need to do it right now. And how are we going to do it? No water. Stuck. So then they come to Abu Bakr. And they started complaining about his wife. Uh, sorry, about his daughter. Who's the daughter of Abu Bakr? Aisha. They said, look what your daughter did to us. We're waiting. We're get delayed. 
We got things to do. They said, Ala tara ma sanata Aisha. Can't you see what your daughter did? She has made the messenger of God and the people wait for her. We don't have water. No one has water. So now Abu Bakr stresses out. Although he was already involved, but now he feels a burden. Right? So now he's just one of the community members. But let's say we are on a camping trip and one of our children causes an issue. Now we all just witnessed this and the parents are already stressing out. But then a, cr a group of the community comes to the parents and says, your son did X, Y, and Z. Like, I don't need the extra pressure. I'm already stressing out. But that's exactly what they put Abu Bakr through. And then he starts recalling another event that happened in his lifetime not too long ago. There was another trip, another expedition. Bani al-Mustaliq. And she lost her necklace. This was not the first time she loses her necklace. Amazing. And by the way, this, this is so powerful because sometimes for us, not everyone realizes that people's mental capacities are not the same. So some people, Allah blesses them and they're very sharp as in they don't forget anything. Others, they constantly forget. It doesn't mean they're stupid. And it doesn't mean they're not paying attention. And it doesn't mean they're mentally handicapped. They could be ADD. They have attention deficit disorder. That's, that's a, re a reality. And a lot of these folks actually misplace things constantly. Not because they're not smart. They're extremely intelligent. They're highly gifted. But now if you don't recognize that someone has this struggle, you are so hurtful when you speak to them. You're like, how many times you have to lose your necklace? How many times you have to lose your keys? You heard that before? How many times we have to look for your purse? Sometimes people look for their sunglasses and they're right here. One time, one time I was talking on the phone and I started looking for my phone. I was talking to my mom and I'm like, where's my phone? And she's like, you're talking to me on the phone. Sometimes you become absent-minded. That's the human nature, right? Now it's funny, we talk about it, now it's funny. But you know, when I was stressing over the phone, I was so upset. And I didn't want anyone to say anything, right? That's how humans are. So what he's remembering now is a huge event that happens in the life of Aisha where she actually stayed back to look for her necklace. She was younger at that time. And that caused a huge disaster. Because the army had left her and a person came who was basically watching the back end of the army. They would have somebody all the way in the front and somebody in the back. And this guy in the back, he actually recognizes her and he's like, what are you doing here? And she's like, I was looking for my necklace. He's like, ride on the camel. And he stands and he walks on his feet and he brings her all the way to Medina. But you know what that event caused? That caused an accusation about her honor. People started saying, well, what did she do with that guy? Because humans are humans. And humans are going to talk. And that was the cause of the revelation of Surah An-Nur. Where Allah speaks explicitly about what happens when you accuse someone and you don't have eyewitnesses to your accusation. It's very ironic, by the way. Now, this is not to undermine. Because right now we're talking a lot about survivors. Survivors of what? Sexual assault. And the fact that it takes them ages to come forward, right? That's a fact. And that's a very tragic thing. And if you look at the statistics, it's sickening. The amount of people that get abused. Whether it's in schools, whether it's in daycares, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in churches and masajid and religious houses of worship. Abuse is all around and it's sickening. But at the same time, this should not give us permission to start accusing people left, right and center without going about it in the proper Islamic way. So the story of Aisha teaches us that. She, the messenger's wife was accused of committing adultery and infidelity. And because of that, the whole community had, had been shaken very, very much. And Abu Bakr specifically because he's the father. So basically, he's like, oh my God, here we go again. This is like a deja vu. Right? Because he's... he's seen this happen before and how things transpire and now this time she's not left behind but now the messenger of god himself decides to stick around and find this thing and everybody's waiting for her and there is no water so then 
he, Abu Bakr the father, goes into where the messenger of God is because he's trying to find his wife, his daughter. And he's very upset. He walks in to talk to his daughter and he's extremely upset with his daughter. Now, what he notices is that the messenger of God is laying down on Aisha's lap. So he tells her in a voice where he's trying to withhold his emotions and to be quiet so he won't wake the messenger of God. Every single time you're a pain in the neck. You're waiting, you're making everybody wait for your necklace. Basically he's like, are you, are you seriously doing this? Like, are we really waiting on your necklace again? And then he starts basically saying things to her to kind of, you can say, shame her. Like, why are you doing this to us? And he started speaking off, speaking his mind. And Abu Bakr actually was extremely calm, but when he would get upset, just like everyone, that's a weakness. So then he started poking her in her, in her on her side. He's like, this, I mean, that, that's just poking her, right? Not hitting her. He's just like, I've had enough. So he poked her in her side. So now she's not comfortable with this. I mean, if somebody touches you on your sides, you kind of get an itch and like twitch. But she didn't want to say anything because the messenger of God is asleep. <laughs> Remember, she's sitting down. The messenger of God is laying in her lap. And her father is telling her, why did you do this to us? And he's pushing her buttons, basically. Physically and metaphorically. She did not want to wake the messenger of God. And she allowed him to go to sleep all the way until the morning time. Fajr Salah comes in. The messenger of God wakes up and it's time for Salah. Again, the Sahaba are looking for water. And there is no water. So when we say they're looking for water, it's not like they looked in their bags again to see if there is water. No, it means they went to see if there is any water springs around. They're out in the desert, they're in the country. And they did not know what to do. You know that Salat al-Fajr, its time is extremely limited. It comes in and goes out. And it's the shortest time of, because every Salat, this is very important by the way, Salat has windows, time windows. You don't have to do Salat right when it comes in. You have a time window. Right? Many people actually stress out about that. And they think if I delay it, if it's within the time window, it's not called delaying Salat. Delaying Salat is if you allow the time window to expire and then you do it after the time. That's very important. Most people think, Delaying it means, you know, I leave it all the way till the end. Well, if Luhur time comes in, let's say at 1 p.m. and it goes out at 4 p.m., you have from 1 to 4. All that time is the same. And ideally, if you're in congregation, then whenever the congregation takes place, that's the ideal time. Okay? So they did not know what to do. And at that very moment, Allah reveals some Quran unto His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ جُنُوبًا فَاطَّهَّرُوا وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَىٰ أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنكُم مِّنَ الْغَائِطِ أَوْ لَامَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ فَلَمْ تَجِدُوا مَاءً فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا فَامْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُم مِّنْهُ مَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيَجْعَلَ عَلَيْكُم مِّنْ حَرَجٍ وَلَكِن يُرِيدُ لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ this is Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, passage number 6. This, whenever you study Islamic law, and you start off with the chapters of purification, this is the main ayah from the Qur'an that talks about purification. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we don't know where a lot of the rules in the Qur'an are. Well, this is one of the rules. Now, Surah Al-Ma'idah was one of the latter chapters in the Qur'an. This is at the end of the time of the Messenger وسلم, being alive. And this was clearly in Medina. So they had been making wudu, we said, since the very early days. But now this is when it takes place within the Qur'an. It's revealed within the Qur'an. What does this ayah say? O you who believe, when you intend to perform salah, your ritual worship, then wash your faces and your hands all the way up to the elbows. 
and wipe your heads or some of your heads and wash your feet all the way till the ankles. If you have a ritual major impurity, meaning you've either had junuban, janaba is basically having intercourse or having um, uh, ejaculated uh, whether awake or asleep, then make sure to purify yourselves. And if you are sick or traveling on a journey or one of you has to use the restroom, meaning you got to use, uh, you got to answer the call of nature or you've had intimacy with your women and you're not able to find water, then you should clean yourselves with pure soil. This is called dry ritual cleansing. Tayammum. And the word is in the Quran. Fatayammamu. Tayammama literally means for somebody to connect with something. Okay? So connect with soil. Famsahu bi wujuhikum wa aidikum min. Wipe your faces and your hands with it. Tayammum is very simple. You simply tap on clean soil. Schools of law differ. But I'm going to tell you what I learned. So you tap. And then you wipe your hands. And then you wipe your face. And that's it. That's your tayammum. You don't have to do anything beyond that. Other scholars may say you wipe your whole arm. But the point is you're not washing yourself with the dirt. And you're like, so what did that do? It didn't do anything. But you have done the alternative. In the absence of water, the alternative to purify yourself spiritually and physically is tayammum until you are able to find water. Then Allah says, ما يريد الله ليجعل عليكم من حرج. Allah does not wish to make things difficult for you. ولكن يريد ليطهركم. Rather, He wants to purify you and He wants to complete His favor onto you in order for you to be grateful. So this is called one of the concessions in Islamic law. In the absence of water, you don't say, I'm not going to do salah. You do tayammum and you perform salah. Very simple. This is in the absence of or in the physical inability to use water. Let's say someone is just fresh out of surgery and they have, you know, they've wrapped them all up and they said, you cannot use water or you'll get sick, you'll have infections. That's another situation. Although water is presently there, but the person physically cannot use the water because it will cause them more harm. So here, this is a revelation that just came at this particular event. Point is, the Messenger of God and the Muslims were so happy to receive this free gift from Allah that He made soil that's pure for them a form of purity when they don't have water. And now also something else that's important. Aisha here was the cause of this event. So they are also jealous of the fact that Aisha again brings about revelation that makes things in the community much easier on everyone. Surah An-Nur chapter 24 started teaching people, if you're going to accuse someone, you better have eyewitnesses with that accusation. You can't simply make false accusations. This is again, others. Rape is a different story. That's a different story, but we're talking about with consensual relations. Somebody cannot say, I saw that person do so and so and simply accuse them. Oh, you have other witnesses to fortify your witness or one witness is not sufficient in that situation. Because the point in Islam is to actually cover up people's sins, not their crimes, sins. So when we talk about assault, when we talk about rape, that is not the same as zina. That's not the same as fornication and adultery. Fornication and adultery are consensual relationships. And if somebody makes a mistake and they're sinning like that in private, we're not supposed to expose them. And there's particular due process. With rape, it's a different story. So again, a lot of people conflate those two things and they confuse them. So here everyone is very happy, but they also feel extremely jealous of this lady who was a reason to receive this gift from God. And that's why the Messenger وسلم, tells her, ما أعظم بركة how much blessings are included in your necklace? This is like one blessed necklace. Because this thing now, is this regulation limited to the people who were camping out that day? We have this concession forever. 
You know the concession in the Quran about shortening salah. You know about shortening salah? What's the verses in shortening salah? Allah says if you're fighting in the battle and you're afraid that the disbelievers are going to turn you away from your religion and you're not able to do salah, then there is no harm and no fault if you shorten your salah. That was in the middle of the battle. But is that rule limited to that condition and circumstance? No, it's a rukhsa forever. Whenever you travel, you use that rukhsa. Not just when you're in that circumstance and condition. And that's part of Allah's mercy. So Usaid ibn Khudayr, Allah be pleased with him, he comes to her and he says, ما أعظم بركتكم يا آل أبي بكر. He makes another announcement. He's like, you guys, the family of Abu Bakr is full of blessings. Remember, just earlier, what were they doing? Abu Bakr, hey man, your daughter, look what she did. Now it wasn't Usaid ibn Khudayr though, to be fair, because remember, not everyone complains. We all know that. Different communities, different families. There are certain complainers, and there are some people who are like, eh, whatever, you know. And then they'll actually come and say nice things. So he says, Jazakallahu khayran. May Allah reward you and compensate you with the best compensation. Fawallahi ma nazala bika amrun, ma nazala biki amrun takrahinahu illa ja'ala Allahu laki minhu makhraja. So now he's talking to Aisha again. This is Usaid ibn Khudayr who was commissioned to go look for her necklace. He didn't come back upset, right? Because like if you come empty handed, you just made me like spend the night looking for your necklace. Right? Like, I'm not very happy right now. But he comes and he says, How blessed are you, O family of Abu Bakr? May Allah reward you. Every single time an event happens that you are uncomfortable with, Allah makes a way out for you, O Aisha. And we have it documented in the Quran. Allah makes a way out for you, and Allah makes it a divine blessing for the Muslim community. And then Abu Bakr comes to her, the same man who the night before was not very happy with her, right? He was reprimanding her and he was guilt tripping her. And he says to her, now at this moment he's different. He's not stressed out. He's not upset. His eyes are shining and he's so happy and so joyous. And he says, Wallahi inna ki la mubaraka. He says, I swear by God, you are blessed. Wallahi inna ki la mubaraka, wallahi inna ki la mubaraka. You're full of blessings. When we say baraka, baraka is al khayr al kathir, a lot of goodness. And also, it's divine blessings placed on a certain individual or a certain uh, object. So, everyone now starts tapping the sand to clean themselves, spiritual cleansing, with dry, dirt in order for them to perform Salatul Fajr and that was the very first Salah that the Muslim community performs with the concession the legal concession about Tayyamum um, and as soon as they finished their Salah they rode back on their camels and they started heading back to Medina because they gave up on the necklace remember the whole story is about the necklace they had spent the whole night there but now Allah gave them something greater and more valuable than the necklace. And it is a gift for the community of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa until the day of judgment. <laughs> when they told the camel of Aisha to get up, they saw the necklace sitting underneath the camel. <laughs> so the necklace was there all along. Right? Like the phone was right here and the sunglasses are in my head. That's how it usually is. When you misplace something, it's really near. And you go tearing up the house like the FBI. And it's right there next to you. You don't really have to go f looking for it. So Aisha's necklace was underneath her camel. May Allah be pleased with her and be pleased with that whole community. Um, so now the Prophet Sallallahu tells us something actually which is specific to this community. He says there are specific gifts that he was given that no other messenger before him was given. And one of the things he says, جُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا the whole of this earth, specifically though Ard, by the way, doesn't mean planet earth all the time. Not every time Ard comes, it means earth. Ard means soil. And Ard, Ard means the ground. And Ard means that which is low. So there is multiple meanings for it. But he says, The surface of this earth, the dirt of this earth has been made for me a place of worship 
and a place of purification. So tayammum we just learned about. Masjid, you don't have to wait to find a masjid to do salah. A Muslim does salah wherever they can if the place is clean. As long as the surface is clean, they perform salah. So we have no excuse of we must go to a house of worship. Other communities before us, they had to. They had to go to churches, they had to go to temples to perform their worship. In fact, that's actually a big deal. You know, the, the talk of the, the temple in Jerusalem, because they believe certain acts of worship they cannot perform except in the temple, right? But for us, the community of Muhammad, you perform salah whenever and wherever you can. Some of the lessons in this particular story. So everyone knows the story now, right? A necklace was lost and then it was found. This is a story called Lost and Found. Right? I think that's what I'm going to title the video. Lost and Found. The Messenger of God وسلم, at this time was about 60 years of age. And his wife is much younger. Clearly she's much younger. But in spite of that, so we're talking about when you're that age, your maturity level is extremely high. And when someone is younger, they lack maturity. That's the rule. They lack life experience. They lack a lot of things. They're still missing out on living life. The more you live, the more you develop experiences that cause you to be more mature. But with that, he was concerned about her pain and concern about her loss. And he completely understood her emotional needs. This is so important. What are the emotional needs of our loved ones? Many of us don't understand that. So again, this is a big challenge. So I usually give examples in my own life, not because I'm trying to showcase anything, but because I don't want to say what your life examples are. But, you know, I'm in, you know, close to 40. And I have children and they don't really have much maturity. And I come back from work, and I'm tired. And one of the girls says, today, right now, right before I came, they're fighting over candy. She comes crying, what's up baby, what's going on? My sister didn't give me candy. She gave the other one candy, and she didn't give me candy. I said, okay, call her over. <laughs> let's, let's solve this problem. They say in Arabic, they have a little proverb. They say, if you want to go mad, become a judge for children, right? Just <laughs> make decisions for children and you'll lose your mind. So I said, like, come over here. What's the deal? And she's chewing that candy. You know, and the other one, of course, her heart is aching right now because that's the candy she wanted to eat. I said, what happened, baby? She's like, well, I gave the younger one because she's a baby and that one is old, so she doesn't have to have one. I said, but it's not fair. You know, she's eating candy. She's like, I already gave her candy earlier. I said, did she give you candy? She's like, yeah, but I wanted that one. Right? So now, of course, in a bad day, if I'm not feeling, because I was entertained. One of my friends, one of the mashayikh, he's in Houston. He was sending me a few messages and I was laughing. So they came at a good time where I'm calm and cool. So I actually entertained that. But if you're tired and you're stressed out and the children come to you with something like that, what do you, how is your action going to be? You like because I'm supposed to take a nap, right? Like a little nap, power nap, and they're coming jumping on top of me over their candies. You would say like, you don't know that I worked all day. <laughs> you don't know that I'm tired, and you come in fighting over a candy. I'll buy the whole store for you, right? Just leave me alone right now. I'm trying to get a nap so I can get ready for the rancho class, right? That's how we react. But for her, she was distraught that she did not get candy. I don't know that feeling. But I have to help myself and get down and understand what is she feeling? She's feeling like she's not loved. She's feeling like her sister is giving favoritism to the other one. She's feeling like I don't care. Now, the least I can do is at least show her that I care. So we laughed about it. We joked about it. I said, okay, right now I just noticed it's in the stomach of your sisters. Do you want me to take it out of their stomach? She's like, no, no, I don't. I said, you can either take it out now or you wait for it to come out. So she started laughing about it and she forgot about the candy. That's it. They're over the situation with the candy. But the point is, show people that you're concerned, right? It's difficult. So this is our struggle. Again, with all of our whatever, we have so many responsibilities, we say. Our main responsibilities are our loved ones. It's not work and it's not anything. It's not school. It's not career. It's our loved ones. Are we showing them concern and empathy? Now, again, somebody may say, 
what is the value of that necklace? Like, come on, 12 bucks. I'll buy the store. But he just delayed the whole community. Everybody was out without water. You know how uncomfortable it is to be without water? And just not to clean yourself? You know, when people travel, they start feeling icky. And they have a bathroom in the, on the plane. They got water all around, right? We go to rest stops and we have water. And we still complain. So even her father says, you made people wait for a necklace. So even her father felt uneasy. And Abu Bakr, we already know how gentle he is, how merciful he is, how loving he is, how kind he is. But this showcases that the messenger is even more than Abu Bakr. So, to her, it was a very important thing. Because it is her jewelry. And jewelry is very valuable. And I can never understand the value of jewelry. Most men cannot. But for ladies, mashallah, you think jewelry is very special. And by the way, this is Allah's creation. He says about them, about ladies. They are raised to love to adorn themselves. That's Allah's nature. Why are you trying to change Allah's nature then? You cannot understand it, that's fine. But don't say, no, no, you don't need that. No, that's something, that's a natural need. And that's something that we should respect. So that's why the Messenger وسلم, took great care about something that was of great value for his wife. And this shows us a few things. How great he was with his family وسلم. Number one, the fact that he decided to camp out to look for the necklace in a place that had no water. Two, he actually sent a delegation, a whole team of people, to go look for it in the place where they had in anticipated that it was lost in. Three, all of the above is actually very small in comparison to how he was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never complained. He never said, why did you do this to us? He never hurt her feelings. He never said anything negative. He was calm. They say the triple C. Cool, calm, and collected. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not lose his cool. That is such a challenge to lose your cool. A lot of us just very quickly we escalate things. But he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was calm and collected. And the reason we know he was calm and collected is he was able to sleep all night long. Everybody's stressing out and he went to sleep. And in fact he was teaching people a lesson because he didn't sleep typically. Right? We know he stood up at night and did vigil and did qiyam al-layl. But that night he was relaxed. He knew that Allah is going to take care of this situation. Don't be hasty. You don't know. Sometimes we want something so bad. You know, I don't know how many times this has happened to you, but sometimes you're late for an event. And you don't realize that Allah is actually protecting you from something. How many times have you heard about things like that? Somebody missed their flight and they were so stressed out about it. And that flight ends up doing what? Crashing. Right? This is not like some... Fans, you know, like some, some, uh, some fiction. This is reality. So sometimes just calm down and you don't know that you may have something better awaiting you. Uh, and by the way, this also showcases something else. He didn't just lay down because he could have laid down in his tent. He laid down on her lap to also give her more comfort, physical touch. Remember that? Love language. He's right there. He's like, look, everybody's complaining about you. But in the end of the day, look where I am at. That's all that matters. The messenger of God is with him. Next, a safar. This word, a safar, uh, today we were talking about in class, there are different types of uh, revelation of the Quran. It, ca it came at different events and different times in the life of the messenger. So some of it is called wahyun hadari. It came down while the prophet was a resident in, in town. And some of it is called safari, meaning while he was on a journey. This is an example of al-wahyu safari. Now in English, so the students were reading it, and in English it says safari. So this is not to be confused with safari. Safari is different than safari. But safari comes from safar. And do you know what safar means in Arabic? Safar means to expose. So when I do this, in Arabic you say, asfara an ra'sihi. He uncovered his head. If a lady does not cover her hair, they call her safir. And the act of uncovering is called sufur. Okay? 
Now the thing with the journey, what are you uncovering exactly? You're uncovering the location where you were standing by going out. But also you are exposing yourself to elements. Because as long as you're a resident, you have a roof on top of yourself. But then you're going to remove that. Now they say something else about safar. They say, As-safaru yusfiru an akhlaqin nas. Traveling exposes the character traits of people. Right? So let's say the flight is delayed. How do people react? You got a jerk behind you on the plane kicking your seat. <laughs> How are you going to react? The flight attendant is racist. <laughs> How are you going to react? All of these reactions showcase what your character is made out of. Now in regular life, you're all comfortable. But then once you travel, another side of you shows up. Right? That's why they said you don't really know somebody until you travel with them. That's a key thing. Another thing you don't know about people until you deal with them financially. Like, man, that person, you know, mashallah, so righteous. I always see him in the masjid. Okay, do business with him. He does business with him, gets screwed up. What happened? What happened to the righteousness? So righteousness is not just in the walls. Righteousness is throughout life. And then they say the other thing, of course, to be exposed to someone and to get to know them is to be their neighbor. Because when you are somebody's neighbor, you see, you know, what they bring inside their homes, who comes into their homes, who goes out of their homes, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, my children, we just moved, like I said, to this new place, and the, the neighbors, I don't know why, may Allah guide them, but they want to decorate for Halloween from now. Like the month hasn't even started. So I come back and my daughter's like, did you see what's on the windows of the neighbors? I said, no, I didn't see. And they have ghost pictures and they have boo-woo and stuff like that. And, and every day they put something new and they're like, did you see it? I said, no, I didn't see it. I don't pay attention to other people's stuff. But the children are just so amazed, you know. Um, anyway, so traveling is something that's extremely difficult, especially in the end of the journey. The beginning, you're excited, you're energized, you're looking forward to it. When you want to come back home, you just can't wait to see that pillow. You just want to knock out, right? So you don't even have emotional energy at this moment. What we're talking about here is there's no more energy. There's no physical energy. They don't have water. They don't have anything remaining. They're just completely done. And also, so this is key. The more tired you are, the less, the less you can deal with people. Let's just say, say that. You're not going to be as diplomatic because you're hungry, you're tired, you, you're lacking sleep, you have... Uh, uh, you know, so many things happening, you know, you have fatigue. So when you're fatigued, your emotions are not really in the right state of mind. And all of that, the Prophet ﷺ remained calm like he was in the rest of his life. The three C's. Cool, calm, and collected ﷺ. He was gentle and he loved gentleness. Rafiqun yuhibbul rifq. Khayrun nasi lin nas. He was the best of people for people. Khayruhum li ahli. He was the best pe person to his family, to his spouse specifically. And he didn't complain about, you know, it's the end of the trip and we're not comfortable at all. He continued to be in a state of tranquility, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next lesson is uh, that whenever you travel in the desert, if you have some water, uh, you should never wait in a place or camp out in a place that does not have water. And the Prophet ﷺ did not want to expose his army, the whole group, to destruction. Because if you don't have water, that's very dangerous. Uh, and he didn't wish to make them uncomfortable unnecessarily simply for a necklace. But he ﷺ, again, so this is not him putting people in danger, but rather him trying to console the heart of his wife, his beloved Aisha. Uh, and they all realize Medina is not that far away. At the end of the day, they're not stranded in the middle of the desert. Um, I told you, basically, it's about 10 miles. This area was only 10 miles away from Medina. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ staying there, it wasn't actually physically difficult and daunting on the community. It was uncomfortable because they were stressing for salah, not for any other reason. Um, so that, that's the key thing, is that he did not expose his community to danger simply because he was trying to show romance. That's key as well, by the way. Because some people, they, they take things like that and then they take them out of context. So let's say we have a whole community doing something and the imam decides to showcase his romance to his wife. And the community is like up in Big Bear and we're stranded or something and the imam is like, yeah, we're looking for my wife's necklace. You're going to fire that imam, okay? That's not acceptable. 
There, he's not waiting for a revelation either. Right? So we got to take things in their proper context. So the Prophet did not expose his community to danger. It was simply somewhat of discomfort. And it was temporary. It was less than 24 hours extra, by the way. So it wasn't that long, that long of a delay. Uh, and then we, we all see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the community with this free gift and concession about how to purify yourselves when you don't have water. Uh, so this event actually was a cause for that. The next lesson is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he had this most beloved person to him. So when he was asked, who do you love more than anyone else? He did not hesitate to say Aisha. He did not hide that. You know, for a lot of us, it's very difficult. Somebody asks you who you love and you actually love your wife, you won't say it in public. You're like, what are the guys going to say about me? Let them say whatever they want to say. You're not more manly than the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Again, many of us, people don't know our wives' names because that's how it is culturally. It's, like, it's a shame. You don't share women's names. It's like, we know the wives of the Messenger. Who has more shame? You are the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, but again, that's how culture, unfortunately, has twisted and turned certain things. So here, this most beloved person to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa she did not find what she can beautify herself with on this trip for her husband. Again, she's not beautifying herself for others. That's key as well. The whole reason she's wearing this is for her husband, sallallahu alayhi wa She did not have her own necklace. She had to borrow her sister's necklace. That's another point very key that they did not really have much resources and it only cost 12 silver coins the weight of which basically is 38 grams of silver so it wasn't really of much value that's the whole point it's like this is a very small necklace and it's silver it's not even gold and she was very concerned about losing it so this again Tells us that the Messenger of God وسلم, did not come to take people's money and wealth away from them. Because he couldn't afford proper jewelry set for his wife. This is the most beloved person to him. Again, remember, he loved her and he meant what he said and he would have offered her if he had. But he did not have material things to offer. So he didn't come to compete with people and collect money from them. He didn't wish to showcase how much materialism he has. Rather, him and his family, and we've said this before when we talk about the humble dwelling, how humble his studio apartment was, they had the bare minimums. So much so that she's borrowing a necklace from her sister. He's saying, this necklace doesn't even cost Saudi, 70 Saudi reals. 70 Saudi reals is like $20. Her necklace doesn't even cost $20. Now, the messenger of God was the same person that at this stage, by the way, when Islam was dominant, much wealth would come over to his masjid and he would distribute it immediately. So much so that he would actually tell people, take this cloth and fill it with wealth and take it here and take it there. So he had access to it, but he did not store it. And this is, this is the challenge because many people, when they are, have access to wealth, there's a lot of corruption that happens. Uh, and some people, it's, it's amazing, although they're already well off, they just can't handle themselves with wealth. They will cheat and they will have all types of uh, twisted behaviors to gain more wealth. The next one is the blessings that our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, uh, was blessed with. Whenever a difficulty took place in her life, Allah made a way out for her and granted the Muslims, the Muslim community, blessings through it. So we already know the story, although it's very long, and that, that could be a whole lecture on its own, that the event where she was accused about her honor, and she was very young, and she had to handle all that pressure. You know, like right now, a lot of these folks that are survivors, they're being told to shut up, right? And a lot of them, the reason why they never spoke up is because of how people react. That's the whole reason. So this is extremely heavy on her. And we have to consider that part that she described it actually. She says, I felt like my liver was exploding. Liver, whenever you have pain in your liver, you feel like you want to die. So that's the pain that she was feeling and experiencing. And of course, it wasn't, it was, she was not, she didn't feel comfortable until Allah revealed verses from the Quran 
We said chapter 24 and Nur verse 11. لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم الله says. Allah brought down her innocence from above the seven heavens and he brought down this revelation that will be recited until the day of resurrection. And it was good for her and good for the Muslim community in the aftermath of the events. Here again, she loses her necklace and the messenger of God delays his whole community, whoever was out with him to look for it. Her father is stressed out. Time for salah comes in and there is no water, but then Allah makes a way out for the Muslims. And now we have this concession until the day of judgment. She goes for hajj with the messenger of God one time. And whenever she enters or comes close to Mecca, this is interesting because we've been talking about hajj now recently and we just experienced hajj. So right before she enters Mecca, she starts her monthly cycle. And that is the most devastating feeling for the sisters whenever they travel for hajj. Because they feel that we can't get the most out of this trip. Again, money, much of it has to do with, again, unfortunately lack of literacy because a lot of us have been told well if the sister is on her period she can't pray and that's incorrect she simply does not do salah she can still do dhikr she can still make dua she can still recite quran she can do all the acts of worship except the ones that are restricted and the ones where allah gave her a break from like fasting and like salah that's it but other than that you still can do a lot of things so when that happened to her, she was so depressed. She started crying. Because she's like, I'm missing out. Everyone's doing hajj and I can't do hajj. She says to the messenger of God, I wish I didn't travel with you guys this year. I wish I didn't go to hajj with you guys. Because remember, she had to draw lots to go out. So she drew the lot, but now she's regretting it. She's like, I wish I didn't even do this. Right? So then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells her this. And this is how gentle and kind he was. This is something, meaning the monthly cycle, menses, is something that Allah has ordained as part of the nature of women folk, the daughters of Adam. It doesn't harm you, it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't take away anything from your spiritual journey. If Ali ma al Hajj, do exactly what the other pilgrims are doing. Simply don't go around the Kaaba in this time period until you're able to do so. And then what we learn is that if someone is stuck and they must leave, there is a concession to do tawaf without that. And they simply have to, maybe, according to some scholars, they will pay some compensation. And other scholars say, because this is something completely out of their control, they don't have to do anything. So it just requires literacy. And here, Aisha was a cause for us to learn these things. That this is not a big deal. It does not diminish your reward for the pilgrimage because you're still struggling in the journey. You're still doing talbi alabbaik, Allahumma alabbaik. You're responding to the call of Ibrahim. You're suffering with everybody else. You're making dua. So you're getting the full reward. Don't worry about it. But from that time on, we also get all the concessions from Aisha. In fact, how many people do extra Umrah when they go to Mecca now? And you know where they have to go? They, have, they, they don't have to. You got to go outside of the Haram boundary. And there is a specific location where Aisha actually goes out of the Haram boundary and initiates her Ihram. And that place is called At-Tan'im. And today it is called Masjid Aisha. So whoever wants to do an extra Umrah in Mecca, they got to go where? Masjid Aisha. And that's why, إِنَّهَا mubaraka. She is someone who Allah placed blessings in. Part of her blessings, it says, that the Messenger of God وسلم, married her when she was still very young and she was still playing. She was, she was a young person. But he allowed her to be so close to him. And what happens is she records everything in his life because of this closeness that she had to him. And he teaches us time and again. A few weeks ago, we spoke about celebrations and how he allowed her to watch the entertainment show in his masjid. Again, just being very kind. He wasn't interested in watching the martial arts, but she was interested. And then we found out she wasn't actually interested. She just wanted to tell all the women, look how close I am to the messenger of God. My cheek on his cheek. My chin on his shoulder. And he's waiting for me to be fully satisfied. Sallallahu alayhi wa And now, the reason, again, it's, it's ultimately divine wisdom, but we recognize from her life, alongside with her marriage with the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa that this man was sent with the simple, pure message. And that's why his deen is called al hanifiya Samha this beautiful, simple way of life. And he announced to the whole world, basically, again, not through his words, but through his actions, 
that this religion has a lot of leeway and there's a lot of concessions and it is not rigid many people make Islam rigid and it is not you don't have water use dirt you can't stand up and do salah sit down and do salah you can't do that do it laying down you can't even do it laying down move your eyelids you can't even do that just have the intention to do it right time and again we're seeing how simple this way is but it requires learning and it requires education and unfortunately when you don't know you make it difficult on yourself because you insist I must stand up brother you, I see you have knee problems I see you have back problems please don't go down like this because it's gonna hurt you we had this during Hajj we had older sisters with us and they refused to get a wheelchair and I'm like you're hurting yourself she's like no I want to worship Allah I want to put my head on the ground I said, if you intend to put your head on the ground, Allah will reward you for it. And we made her, like basically me and my friend, and we were convincing her, you know, and we're like, look, we know what this is, you know, we study Islam for a living, right? So please believe us, trust us. She's like, if Allah is mad at me, you, I'm going to blame you guys. I said, yeah, sure, you can blame us. Our job here is to actually facilitate for you worship. And then she enjoyed it, alhamdulillah. She had a great experience. May Allah accept from us all. May Allah bless this woman, Aisha. Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. So she has rights over us. So the least we can say is, may Allah have mercy on us, may Allah, on her, may Allah reward her for her sacrifice. Because through her sacrifice and through this discomfort that she felt temporarily, our community has this concession and what makes us, uh, you know, what makes our faith easily practiced. That pure soil is a source of us to use in our ritual purity. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وأسك الله تبلس مسنج محمد ت elevate his mansion and rank and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers as he did with إبراهيم his family and righteous followers in the past ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأسك الله to give us the best of this life and the best of the next life and to protect us from the fire. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ridaka wal jannah wa na'udhu bika min sakhatika wa min al-nar. We ask you Allah for your pleasure and for paradise. And we seek refuge in you from your anger and from the fire. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. We ask you Allah to help us to remember you and to mention you at all times, to be grateful to you for all your blessings through our words and through our actions and to worship you in the best of ways and to follow the model of your messenger Muhammad in our behavior and in our lives and in our family ties. والحمد لله رب العالمين we praise Allah the Lord of everything in existence سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك Allah is far above any imperfection we testify that he's the only one deserving of worship we seek his forgiveness and we repent to him and we praise him for he's the Lord of everything in existence والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته